So thanks for coming to the Selfish Conservation Society second webinar in our series. Um, today, we're going to be hearing from Tyler Dornan, who's a um, PhD candidate at the University of Adelaide. Uh, and he was the recipient of last year's uh, Selfish Conservation Society small grant. Um, so we are excited to hear about his project, looking at some of the internal workings of sawfish up in Northern Australia. And I'll just hand it off. Okay, I'll try and share my screen. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen and my presentation. Yes, we are all set. Awesome. So, uh, hey everyone, thanks so much for coming to my webinar. My name is Tyler Dornan and my project is on the interactions between the paired diet and microbiome of the Kimberley region's top predators, including sawfish. Um, now, this project is part of my PhD, so naturally results will be coming through over a number of years. So today what I'm going to present to you is only part one of our project, which is the preliminary results of the microbiome research. I'd like to thank the Sawfish Conservation Society for being the first to fund this project. And without your help and funding, we wouldn't have been able to accomplish as much as we have in the last 12 months. So thanks to the Sawfish Conservation Society. So while my project is going to investigate the diet and microbiome of multiple species, uh, the sawfish is definitely the primary species of interest for this project. So a little about sawfish. Uh, there are five species of sawfish in the world. Uh, they are the green sawfish, uh, the large tooth sawfish, or as we call it in Western Australia, the freshwater sawfish. There's also the narrow sawfish, which forms its own genus. And then there's the small tooth sawfish and the dwarf sawfish. And following historical exploitation for their fins and rostra, the primary threats to sawfish today are through bycatch and habitat degradation. All five species of sawfish are considered critically endangered with declining populations by the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. And the distribution of all five species of sawfish have undergone uh, massive contractions from their historical maxima. So because of all this, sawfish are considered one of the most endangered families of fishes in the world. And an interesting aspect of studying sawfish in Australia is that four of these five critically endangered species can be found in northern Australia. So these are those four species. Up in northern Australia and the outskirts, we've got the green sawfish, the freshwater sawfish, which again is just uh, Australian for large tooth sawfish. Uh, the narrow sawfish and the dwarf sawfish. And for the most part, you can see that they kind of cohabitate the same environments, uh, with the exception being the dwarf sawfish, where it's much more of a constrained coastal environment in northern Australia. So generally, where you can find one sawfish in a marine environment, there's potential to find multiple other species. And it makes it a really unique uh, place to study sawfish, to be a sawfish researcher in northern Australia. So the overall objective of this project is to explore how the microbiome, the diet and uh, environmental conditions all interact and their implications for the host. And what makes a paired diet and microbiome study perfect is that while they're both intrinsically linked and important to host health, we're able to sample both diet and microbiome simultaneously, yielding uh, a great deal of information per sample. In this case, we do this by firstly catching the animals and directly sampling their feces by swabbing the interior of their cloaca. And contained within these feces is not only the residual DNA from the food that they've been consuming, but also the DNA of the bacteria that are present throughout their digestive tract. So uh, by virtue of taking just a single sample from the cloaca of these uh, critically endangered fish, we're able to get a snapshot of both the diet and the microbiome at one time, and hopefully allowing for some interesting discoveries to be made. Now, while the importance of understanding the diet of these threatened fishes is easy to conceptualize, uh, the benefit of understanding the microbiome is a little less obvious. For these fish, I'm specifically looking at the gastrointestinal microbiome. And for those that are unfamiliar, this is the vast community of microbes that live throughout your digestive tract. So while the microbiome of uh, these fish might be comprised of bacteria, archaea, fungi, and other small, tiny little microorganisms, I've limited my research just to uh, bacteria in this case. But these bacteria, <clears throat> they, they play an enormous role in host health. Uh, 
such as helping with the digestion of food, the conversion of toxic substances, uh, assisting in osmoregulation, and uh, conveying pathogen resistance, just to name a few. So by finding out, firstly, what bacteria are there, we can begin to understand what roles might be playing out in the microbiome of these fish. And because no one's really explored the microbiome of the sawfish in this way, everything we discover is hopefully going to be new and exciting. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me, but beyond the microbiome, the next step of this project is understanding the diet and food web dynamics of these predators. So this can massively assist in conservation actions, especially now as the invasive cane toads have reached the area and the invasive red horse uh, crustacean might be just around the corner. So while some diet analyses have been performed in the area before, they've and they've provided excellent and actionable information, these have been limited to microscopy and stable isotope analysis. Our methods, on the other hand, uh, will be, com while complementary to both of these, they'll be able to generate highly sensitive dietary information while also being paired with the microbiome uh, and with the context of environmental conditions. So to finally tie together, we'll also be exploring how environmental conditions and habitat constrain both diet and microbiome for a bit more of a holistic diet, microbiome and environmental exploration of these animals. So the environment is going to influence both the diet and microbiome. So different habitats will have different food and different foods influence the microbiome. But the environmental conditions themselves directly influence microbial structure, particularly between marine and freshwater environments. So understanding how environments constrain the diet and microbiome of these fish is a great way to get this more holistic picture of the fish and their place in the ecosystem. So my project can be summarized into four aims or objectives. So the first one, is to go out there and obtain some fecal samples. So we're gonna to have to swab the cloaca of aquatic predators, such as freshwater sawfish, green sawfish, a number of species of sharks, uh, barramundi, and a few other species of aquatic predators that aren't included in this presentation. Following that, we're going to be analyzing the fecal microbiome of these uh, aquatic predators. So we'll provide the first insights into sawfish microbiomes, and we're going to infer how their diversity and function differ from other species. Following that, we're going to investigate sawfish diets. So using the same tools as we did for the microbiome, we're gonna use genetic metabarcoding to determine the diets of these sawfish to, in theory, unprecedented levels of sensitivity and taxonomic resolution. And as I said before, to tie it all together, we're going to look into a diet microbiome environment interaction. Uh, so how diet influences the microbiome and its implications for host health, and also understanding how both diet and microbiome are together constrained by environmental conditions. So this is the primary study area for my project, uh, the Kimberley region of Northwestern Australia. And you can see with this uh, blue line, uh, that's the Fitzroy River, which meanders from deep within the Kimberley to the estuary uh, just south of Derby here. So within this coastline, uh, right where the Fitzroy empties out, those four species of sawfish uh, can all be found inhabiting the same waters and using the habitat as nursery. But the freshwater sawfish is particularly interesting because while they use the coastline to pup, just like the other species of sawfish, their young uh, swim upstream of the river where they spend about the first six years of their life growing. Uh, they can be found pretty far upstream too. So they've been found just north of Fitzroy Crossing, which is about a 400 kilometer journey from the mouth. And that's an incredible journey, swimming 400 kilometers upstream from where you were born up in the estuary. And it's a journey that often can't be performed in many other river, many other rivers, sorry, because of river modification or disturbances. It's also interesting to note that the dwarf sawfish are also known to inhabit uh, the very downstream areas of the Fitzroy River, where uh, there's still a lot of tidal influences. So there's still potential to sample uh, these uh, tidally influenced stretches of the river to capture some uh, dwarf sawfish. And that would make it so that we've been able to sample three out of the four species of sawfish that inhabit Northern Australia, which would be a fantastic uh, outcome. 
And this is a quick map that I made showing some of the samples we've obtained with the blue line here representing just that Fitzroy River, that uh, great habitat for freshwater sawfish. It's important to note that this map doesn't include our most recent trip and also only shows the location of samples that were successfully processed. Uh, what came as a bit of a surprise to us is about half of the cloacal samples that we obtained uh, yielded insufficient DNA for this kind of microbiome analysis, which was very surprising. Uh, there's usually microbes everywhere. So being able to not get enough microbial DNA from inside the cloaca of a sawfish was a bit of a surprise, but it's probably just a reflection of their defecation rates and other kinds of behavior. So one interesting point to note is that there's this large purple uh, point just north of the others. And what this shows is that a large amount of freshwater sawfish were captured in that pool. And unfortunately, this point largely comes from a sawfish kill where the sawfish became trapped in an isolated pool and weren't able to survive due to uh, the heat and a lack of oxygen. But during their rescue efforts, my collaborators, Chris Alia and Tegan Lee, were able to collect uh, diet and microbiome samples from a number of living deceased, uh, from a number of living and deceased sawfish. So this data set might uh, prove to be an interesting avenue towards investigating how environmental stress could shape sawfish microbiomes. Mm. All right. <clears throat> so this is another map showing some of the uh, the samples our team have collected from uh, in and around Exmouth Gulf, which is a fair bit south of the Kimberley region. And you can see that a number of green sawfish and nova sharks have also been captured here and swabbed. Unfortunately, uh, to date, we haven't been able to capture any freshwater sawfish from a marine environment. So we can't directly compare how microbiomes change within a species across a salinity gradient yet. But because of these green sawfish samples, uh, we might hopefully see some interesting differences between two very closely related fish species that inhabit vastly different environments, that being a marine environment and a freshwater environment. So yeah, we've been able to capture uh, specimens from a wide diversity of habitats so far. And this is just a video slide characterizing some of the work we do up in the Kimberley region. So the top left is the main channel of the Fitzroy, showing that it's a pretty pristine river with thick riparian vegetation coming right up to the banks and a lot of complex habitat for fishes to thrive. Up until recently, it was actually quite pristine because there were no aquatic uh, invasive uh, aquatic animals in this river. But recently that's changed with the incursion of cane toads and also the uh, red claws are also threatening to further invade this area. Uh, in contrast, uh, the video in the top right, this is an isolated channel located near a station in Western Australia. And these kinds of isolated channels or pools can uh, dry out during the dry period and unfortunately will kill any sawfish present unless they're rescued, just like that sawfish kill I mentioned earlier. So this is a video of us netting to determine if there were any sawfish in the channel that will need to be rescued. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to capture any sawfish with the net during that day, but we've also got another project going on where we're trying to detect sawfish just by detecting their DNA in the water. And so while that net was deployed, we also collected some water samples and we were able to successfully detect sawfish DNA from that channel. So this is a, a great project that we've been getting off the ground and it's an awesome early warning system that's going to be complementary to monitoring freshwater sawfish populations throughout the Fitzroy. Um, yeah, and the bottom video just shows uh, the swabbing process. So this generally just involves capturing a sawfish uh, and turning them upside down to induce tonic immobility where they tend to go into a kind of anesthetic uh, and we perform a minimally invasive swab to collect any residual DNA from within, from within the cloaca. So yeah, it's an absolutely beautiful study site to have. Uh, and yeah. So the Fitzroy River and freshwater sawfish. Florida and Northern Australia have been described as the two lifeboat areas for sawfish in general, but the Fitzroy River in Northwestern Australia in particular serves as one of the final strongholds for the freshwater sawfish. In this river alone, 
substantially more individuals are recorded here than anywhere else in the world. And one of the reasons for this is that the Fitzroy is largely unregulated, with the major exception being the Cambalan Barrage pictured at the bottom here. So the Fitzroy, fairly unregulated, and it's a fairly isolated river away from much more human disturbances uh, compared to other rivers. But this barrage uh, pictured at the bottom here represents a major uh, barrier for dispersal for sawfish, particularly during low flow periods. So during these low flows, sawfish can even become trapped just downstream of the barrage where they need to be rescued from like a cement pool at the bottom. But uh, apart from this, sawfish are generally capable of moving throughout the Fitzroy during the wet season when flows are higher. Uh, allowing them to complete that 400 kilometer journey sometimes. Uh, so yeah, the Fitzroy is an absolutely critical habitat for freshwater sawfish. Well, I don't know why it's skipping to. All right. So these are the general methods for both my microbiome and diet analysis. And to accomplish this, we perform what is called DNA meta barcoding. So what this involves is just looking at a tiny section of DNA highlighted by the red up there, rather than the whole genome of the organism that we're trying to detect. But by looking at this tiny snippet of DNA containing its unique sequence of base pairs, A, T, C, or G, we can determine what kind of bacteria or fish DNA is present in the feces. So specifically, the first step is we obtain the cloacal samples from these fish using a sterile cotton swab. From here, the total DNA is extracted from these swabs, uh, with some of the DNA being used for diet analysis and some of it being used for microbiome analysis. Following that, uh, for the DNA used for microbiome analysis, a tiny region of the bacterial genome called the 16S rRNA gene is amplified using PCR. And again, that's represented by this tiny red uh, section of DNA. Um, so we amplify that little section and we send it off to uh, the Australian Genome uh, Research Facility where they sequence that little segment of DNA. And what they do with sequencing is that they essentially just read the exact order of bases, A, T, C, and G. And by reading that, we can uh, distinguish uh, unique sequences from each other. So well, these unique sequences are distinguished from each other. And uh, each sequence is, each unique sequence is called a, an amplicon sequence variant. Or from here on, they'll be referred to probably as a feature. So these features or ASVs represent a unique bacterium. And these unique sequences that make up each feature is compared to a taxonomic database, and the sequence is assigned to a bacterial taxonomy, ideally at the species level, but often when these features are assigned to a taxon, it's often at the genus level or even lower, because the databases are always incomplete and there's just so much bacteria out there, you can't know it all. But in our case, we were able to use the new Green Genes 2 taxonomic database to assign taxonomy. So uh, thankfully, we have a pretty high proportion of bacteria that were assigned taxonomy to the species or genus level. But once we have an idea of what bacteria are there, we can then begin to perform some basic diversity analysis. So to start with, this is just a simple Venn diagram showing that across these sp four species of fish, so the barramundi, the freshwater sawfish, the green sawfish, and the nervous shark, across these four species, 322 unique bacterial families have been discovered. And there's a couple interesting things here that start raising some questions. Uh, one of them is that the two sawfish have the highest number of unique bacterial families. So of the 322 bacterial families identified, uh, a total of 49% of those are found exclusively within the two sawfish, which is much higher than any of the other species. Though it's also worth noting that uh, the two sawfish also have the highest sample size. So 18 for freshwater sawfish and 12 for the green sawfish. Uh, another interesting thing to note is that the green sawfish shares more bacterial families with the nervous shark than with the closely related freshwater sawfish. And this is likely just due to the green sawfish and the nervous shark sharing the same marine environment. Uh, but it will also be interesting to see how much diet overlap these two species have to determine if this overlap is due to environmental conditions, 
uh, diet or host specific characteristics. But this uh, Venn diagram is only looking at families and overlap between them. So it doesn't really show too much. So uh, we can move on and we can look at uh, what this graph shows, which is the Shannon diversity index at the feature level of bacteria, which again is just a microbe represented by a unique sequence of DNA. And for those that are not familiar, uh, instead of just showing the total number of features, the Shannon diversity index also considers the evenness of the feature abundances. So what that means is that it looks at the total number of microbes and considers if the microbiome is dominated by just a handful of microbes or if uh, abundances are spread out across a great number of different microbes. So generally, a higher Shannon value means a more complex and balanced microbiome. And what this shows is that with the minor exception of the nervous shark, which point which data points are fairly close together, uh, there's a decent amount of variation within each species. Uh, also, the microbiome of most fish were significantly different from other fish, except for barramundi, which showed no significant difference in the Shannon index between either the freshwater sawfish or the green sawfish. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, traditionally, it was believed that uh, a more complex and balanced microbiome represented by a higher Shannon value uh, means it's more resilient and more healthy. And while there is some truth to that, uh, we have been transitioning away from that and acknowledging that to gauge the health of a microbiome, there's a lot more to understand than just its complexity and Shannon value. Uh, so to take it a step further, we can look at the beta diversity. So which uh, this beta diversity measures the precise differences in the taxonomic composition. So looking at exactly how similar or different the, the microbiomes are between fish and between species. And what we see is a pretty clear difference between marine and freshwater fishes. So the two ellipses that cover the uh, red and the orange dots uh, represent the nervous shark and the green sawfish which are our marine species. And it's clearly going in a different direction from our freshwater species, and they're grouped fairly separately. And um, statistical tests also show that uh, most of the differences between species pairs are between a marine fish and a freshwater fish, including between the green sawfish and the freshwater sawfish, despite, again, being so closely related. They clearly share a different uh, complexity in microbiome and a different composition in microbiome, the two sawfish species. Also, uh, unlike in the Shannon diversity, there's now a difference between barramundi and freshwater sawfish, indicating that while the complexity of the microbiome might not differ between these two fish, uh, the species of bacteria that make up the complexity do indeed differ. Um, now, the freshwater sawfish and the barramundi occupy the same habitat. So, how much of this compositional difference is due to host specific characteristics and how much is due to diet? Uh, these are one of the questions that we're hoping to answer once we get more results, particularly on the diet. These graphs show the core microbiome of the two sawfish species that we've captured at the family level. So on the, uh, on the left, it shows the core bacterial families that make up the microbiome. And the bottom shows the relative abundance of that bacterial taxon across a specific proportion of samples represented by color. So what that means, for example, is if we look at green sawfish, we can see that the bacterial family Vibranaceae has a relative abundance of about 0.128% across at least 50% of sawf green sawfish samples. Uh, and Vibranaceae represents the most abundant core microbiome for that species. And uh, this is interesting because most of this Vibranaceae abundance is explained by the bacterial genus Vibrio, which contains uh, many pathogenic strains, including those that cause fish ulcers, skin lesions, or even fish death. So... Um, Sorry, so this genus also contains Vibrio cholera, which is responsible for, chol for cholera outbreaks. And Vibrios are generally associated with marine fish and marine environments, which 
held true for our data set as it was only really detected in our marine fish samples. Also in the same Vibranaceae family is the bacterium Photobacterium damselae, which was abundant in pretty much all of our marine samples and once again is known as a dangerous pathogen in aquaculture across the world. So while the detection of these pathogenic bacteria don't necessarily mean that they exist at a load sufficient to cause disease for the fish, the fact that this family uh, represents the most abundant core microbiome of the green sawfish, in my opinion, absolutely warrants further investigation. But looking at the, uh, the freshwater sawfish now, the family Enterobacteraceae, which is just here, also forms a core component of their microbiome, which can be largely attributed to the abundances of a bacterium called Plesiomoenus shigalloides, a species of bacteria identified as another dangerous pathogen that was only detected in our freshwater fish. So this bacterium is also capable of killing fish and also causing a number of human illnesses. For the rest of the core microbiome for these two species, at least at the family level, uh, they're generally considered a typical uh, gut microbiome involved with things like digestion and metabolism. Though it was interesting to see just how important this family of Vibranaceae was for green sawfish and also to see such a clear separation of marine pathogens and freshwater pathogens. So the benefits of this diversity knowledge. So these results are just some of the preliminary work that we've been able to do. Uh, so there's still a lot more to accomplish uh, before the end of my project. Uh, but regardless, these represent the first insights into the microbiome of both the freshwater sawfish and the green sawfish and also a number of other endangered species that weren't included in this presentation. So by identifying how certain pathogenic bacteria change over time and between individuals, these results may serve as an early look into pathogen risk for these critically endangered fish. And there's also potential to serve as a baseline. So if in a few years we sample the microbiome of these species again and see that there's a huge change in the microbiome composition or that there's an increase in certain indicator bacteria, it may suggest that the environment or the food sources have undergone some kind of disruption. In particular, I'm interested to see if the microbiome of any of these fish change after the poisonous cane toads have fully established themselves in the food web of their system, which they will surely do eventually. Uh, but we can take this uh, microbial diversity analysis a bit further beyond taxonomy and we can start making inferences about what function these bacteria are performing in the microbiome. So this is the method slide that I showed earlier describing how we're able to use a tiny fragment of DNA highlighted in the red here to determine the taxonomy of all the bacteria. But you'll notice that this red section covers only a tiny, tiny amount of the whole circular bacterial genome, uh, much, much smaller than what's actually represented here. So we're actually missing out on essentially all of the genes that encode for proteins that allow the bacteria to do whatever it is that they do. If we did know uh, all the genes of the bacterium, we would have an idea of what kind of proteins they could synthesize and we can begin to predict what kind of functions it might be carrying out. Now, it is possible to do this directly using a shot, uh, sorry, using a method called shotgun metagenomics, where we're able to read the entire genome of all the bacteria present in a sample. But uh, to date, it's currently prohibitively expensive, uh, especially at a scale such as this, though it is getting cheaper, but currently it's not feasible to do this. So instead, what we can do is infer the bacterial genomes. As an example, imagine we had two species of those Vibria bacteria I mentioned earlier. One of those species has already had their entire genome mapped out and stored in a database, while the other species hasn't. It's got unknown genomes. But using known patterns of gene inheritance and phylogenetics, we can make a pretty accurate prediction of what the genome of the unknown Vibrio is based on the genome of the known Vibrio and other closely related bacteria. Uh, 
And of course, these kinds of predictions come with some level of uncertainty. So don't worry, there are thresholds of confidence that are included in this analysis. And this is essentially what this diagram at the end here tries to say, that we can, instead of just using a tiny fragment to determine taxonomy, we can now use that tiny fragment to predict the entire genome of a specific bacteria. And the way that this is accomplished is with a genomic tool called PyCrust2, or uh, in broader terms, the phylogenetic investigation of communities by reconstruction of unobserved states. And the way this generally works, uh, it's described in four steps. So the first step, step one, is to create a phylogenetic tree containing a taxa with the known gene contents. So in this case, it'd be Vibrios with uh, their whole genomes mapped out. Uh, and uh, it's represented by the blue dot. And also on this phylogenetic tree is that Vibrio that we have no idea what their entire genome looks like. Uh, it's unknown gene contents, and that's represented by gray. So the next step to do there is to prune the phylogenetic tree such that only taxa with known gene contents remain on this tree. And from there, uh, using uh, known patterns of gene inheritance and phylogenetic relationships, we are able to infer the ancestral states of the known taxa, which are represented by orange. If we know the genomes of these two bacteria here, we have a decent idea of the ancestral state represented by orange. And from there, we can use those ancestral states and essentially do the opposite. We can now predict the most likely gene contents of our once unknown taxa represented by yellow. So we've gone from a, a tiny snippet of DNA where we know where they're placed phylogenetically, but we don't know their gene contents to predicting their entire genome based on very closely related bacteria and their ancestral states. And what this does is it opens up an entirely new window into uh, potential analyses, looking at the function of these microbes in the microbiome. And this is an example of some of the analyses that we can do. So you might remember that I mentioned there was a large sawfish kill in one of the isolated pools of the Fitzroy River. So my colleagues were able to swab some of the living and dead sawfish from this kill. And this slide covers some of the biochemical pathways that were significantly different between the living and the dead sawfish. So the, uh, the dead sawfish represented by blue lines and the yellow sawfish represented by yellow lines, or at least their microbiomes. And what this shows is that pathways involved in biodegradation are significantly upregulated in the dead sawfish compared to the living sawfish. <clears throat> and this is what you'd kind of expect in a dead animal. So as the sawfish begins to decompose and host controlled processes like immune responses stop, you'll get more bacteria focused on degradation. So this has been a, a nice sanity check for the pie crust tool. <clears throat> on the other hand, you have the living sawfish represented by yellow and there's upregulated pathways in the living sawfish involving processes like transcription and translation, which would suggest that the bacterial communities are metabolically active, engaging in things like protein synthesis and the cellular processes necessary for growth and maintenance. And yeah, this is just an example of the kind of uh, ways that functional analysis can be performed. But onto a less bleak topic, uh, the graph this graph here shows how a number of nitrogen pathways differ between our five species. And I should say that none of the none of the deceased sawfish were included in these analyses or any of the other, other analyses except for the previous slide. Uh, so nitrogen cycling is important to the survival of any species. But I was particularly interested in looking at nitrogen uh, because recently it's been suggested that the microbiome of elasmobranchs, so our sawfish and shark species here, uh, the microbiome might play a direct role in their osmoregulation, which is just how these fish maintain internal salt and water balance in their cells. So for a bit of background, uh, elasmobranchs maintain their osmotic balance with the water that they're in by regulating uh, the concentration of some nitrogen or nitrogenous compounds, including uh, urea. So 
Elasma branks in marine environments need to have higher concentration of nitrogenous compounds like urea in their tissues compared to freshwater environments because the marine water is far more salty, so they need to be containing more nitrogen to balance their osmotic pressure. So <clears throat> while the microbiome, it's known to definitely have in, an indirect influence on the concentration of these nitrogenous compounds through processes like their digestion of food, but recently, it's been suggested that the microbiome of these elasmobranchs might play a direct role in osmoregulation through either the synthesis or conversion of these nitrogenous compounds or their precursors. And what we can see here in this graph is that the freshwater sawfish, uh, represented by red, uh, uh, it, what, what we see is that compared to the freshwater sawfish, our marine elasmobranchs, the, the green sawfish and the nerva shark, they almost across the board have higher activity in nitrogenous pathways, including ammonia assimilation, cyanate degradation, and the urea cycle, which in my, in my opinion is a, a very interesting find, and it's great to be able to uh, observe that. Uh, but taking a deeper look into two of these pathways, cyanate degradation and ammonia assimilation, shows a bit more of a detailed story. So on the left uh, shows the enzyme cyanase, uh, which uh, breaks down cyanate into ammonia and carbon dioxide. So ammonia is a precursor to urea, which could have implications for osmoregulation. But even more interesting is the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, uh, an enzyme, oops, sorry, uh, and an enzyme absolutely critical for life that is also known to influence the osmoregulation in fish. Uh, by facilitating ion exchange between cells. Uh, but uh, this enzyme tends to be found uh, in higher concentrations where exchange happens, such as the gills and the rectal glands of elasmobranchs. And this enzyme was also much higher in the marine elasmobranchs than in the freshwater sawfish, uh, which you can see here. Another fantastic result in terms of this topic uh, moving over to ammonia assimilation, uh, glutamine synthetase and glutamate synthetase also both convert ammonia, which again is a precursor for urea and also has likely an influence on elasmobranch uh, osmoregulation. So there's going to be a lot to tease apart uh, from this data in the future, but there's definitely some interesting things going on here with the marine microbiome clearly having a greater role in nitrogen cycling than in the freshwater sawfish. And I haven't got into the details of the urea cycle again, which is going to be absolutely critical, but uh, just based off this previous graph, there's also appear apparently something going on there too, where the urea cycle, the chemical pathways associated with that tend to be uh, upregulated in our marine elasmobranchs relative to our freshwater sawfish. So I can't wait to delve into that too. Uh, some of the benefits of this functional knowledge. So by identifying microbe function, uh, we can begin to understand how changes in microbiome structure may influence sawfish health, their ability to tolerate changes in environmental conditions, and how the host might respond to changes in, in, in microbiome composi composition. Uh, in time, these insights will also be related to host diet and environmental conditions. And in doing so, we can untangle the complex interactions that happen and determine, uh, hopefully precisely, what microbiome functions are influenced by what triggers. And of course, a lot of microbiome research focuses just on composition, so the diversity of micro microbes. Uh, but this work demonstrates that for essentially no additional cost, the amount of additional information obtained from 16S metabarcoding can be vastly expanded with the pie crust tool uh, and functional analysis. So there's a lot more to work on there. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, I think I rushed through it a little bit, but thank you all. Uh, thank you to the Sawfish Conservation Society for organizing this. And thank you to Carissa for hosting. Uh, are there any questions? Thanks, Tyler. Um, great presentation. Does anybody have a question to start with? Uh, I, have, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Who was that? Sorry. <laughs> you go first. No, no, go ahead. Is that Megan? No, this is Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> 
Um, sorry if it's kind of loud. Um, but really great presentation, really cool work. Um, and I don't, I can't remember if you said this or not, but how do you make sure like it's that the bacteria is not being like bacteria from your lab or something? Like, how do you guys ensure that it's just bacteria from the cloaca when you're doing? Sorry, uh, so sorry. If I understand the question, uh, it's a bit hard to hear. Are you asking how we can be sure that the bacteria in our samples aren't from environmental or lab contamination? Yeah, yeah. Like, what do you guys do to to make sure? Yep. Uh, so for the microbiome, uh, every time we go out and sample the cloaca, uh, we also take negative controls. Uh, so we essentially just open it up to the air and sometimes the water, and we just then put it in our preservative, and that also gets extracted and profiled uh, along with the cloacal samples. And from there, uh, using R, there's a few packages, uh, decontem, for example, that looks at the, the microbes present in the controls because there's microbes in the air. So even if you hold it, hold it open in the air, you'll probably get a very, very minuscule amount of microbes. So it looks at what tiny amount of microbes are present on the negative control, and it does some complicated math and it says, uh, all right, so given these controls have these bacteria, uh, there's uh, an X amount of percentage chance that uh, these small amounts of bacteria in your real samples might also be contamination and it removes them. Uh, so yeah, and in terms of environmental contamination, uh, sometimes it can be hard, uh, but a number of experimental studies have been performed showing that the uh, there's not really any noticeable contamination from the surrounding water inside the cloaca of the sharks and rays. Um, so as long as you pat it down dryly, make sure no seawater gets in the cloaca, uh, it's pretty reasonable to assume that there's no major contamination from the surrounding water. Okay, cool. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, that's what we do with eat, like environmental DNA. I didn't even think about doing like. Um that you would do that with the swab too. So that's cool. Yeah, okay, yeah. Cool. Thank you. No, no worries. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Marie. Um, anyone else have a question? I'm a bit to think. I'll ask you a question, Tyler. <laughs> I, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on how like down the road, all of this functional knowledge um, can contribute to conservation of these fish within these environments, for example, uh, like in those isolated pools you were talking about versus the open pools in the main channel or sawfish trap below barriers? Can we look at different levels of stress or how, how can we use that to help um, sort of inform conservation for this habitat? Yeah, <clears throat> and that's always the, uh, the tough question with uh, microbiome studies relating that to uh, practical and actionable information. And it is difficult to relate that, especially with such a complex system as the microbiome. But uh, in terms of diversity analysis, I would say actionable information is tends to be limited. But uh, once we start understanding what kind of functions they perform, um, what kind of proteins that they're synthesizing uh, that might be as, uh, associated with stress proteins, uh, we it's it's yeah, it's going to be hard to tie that into uh, conservation actions. But it's uh, definitely an interesting thing. Um, sorry, uh, it is. Yeah, it's a challenge. But these are so the microbiome, even in human studies, is an emerging field still. So not many. One way that the microbiome has been used in human studies is, for example, fecal transplants. And I'm not suggesting that we go out and perform fecal transplants, um, but. Yeah, there's still a lot of room to grow this field, uh, particularly in functional that functional analysis. So I'm happy to chat with anyone who thinks that this might be an interesting field to expand with their research. Um, but yeah, fairly limited at the moment, I would say, in terms of the microbiome. Um, but the benefit of the examples is that we've sampled the microbiome, but we've also sampled the diet. So uh, the diet is going to offer much more actionable information. Well, it's very cool to see um, some more detailed work on sawfish as well. All of this internal stuff is very new, you know, not just in sawfish, but in everything, as you, mm -hmm. as you said, it's just an emerging field. And um, 
a lot of sawfish around the sawfish research around the world is just focused on finding the sawfish <laughs> because they're so difficult to track down. So it's really cool to see uh, research that's getting into more of the detailed sort of intricacies of sawfish um, mm. in these in these spots like Northern Australia where you can find them quite readily. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was one one of the getting out there is so difficult and expensive. So we wanted to try and maximize the data that we get. And so initially, this project solely focused on eDNA detection, but we're catching so many sawfish, we figured we might as well expand this and focus more on the diet and microbiome. Uh, so yeah, originally, this was just an eDNA project, but we thought it would be interesting to explore this aspect and see what turns up. Very cool. Uh, are there any other questions on there? I don't think so. Well, um, in that case, thank you, Tyler, very much for a wonderful presentation. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, really nice to have you on board here. And um, this presentation will also be posted online um, if you want to share it with anybody else. Um, and yeah, otherwise, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tyler. And hope to see you at the next webinar series. Thanks.